Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, really appreciate it. And um, for so many families out there, you know, we really try to use this REACH program to come in and reach into your communities to hopefully bring you some information that you didn't have before, but that's going to help you in your life moving forward. So thank you guys for being here again. One of the issues that we know that we face within the autism community is early identification and intervention. And, you know, my son is 26, and I can sadly say that I still hear the same reports about what a family faces during those early years when you think that something is up with your kid and you go to your pediatrician and your pediatrician says, give it time. Um, well, we want you guys to have the information that you need so that you can do like a friend of mine had said to me 24 years ago, don't take that. <laughs> if you feel like there's something that's up with your kid, there's no reason. There's no reason. We're going to hear about that today to just wait. Um, even if, even if it's nothing, it's just a little developmental blip. You can still do some really good stuff on the front end that's going to help your kid with their future. So this morning, I want to welcome Dr. Geraldine Dawson uh, to the REACH program. And I'm good, before we get started, I'm going to read her brief bio here. Um, so Dr. Dawson is the William Cleland Distinguished Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Duke University, where she's also a professor of uh, pediatrics and professor of psychology and neuroscience. Dr. Dawson is the director of the Duke Institute for Brain Sciences um, and the Duke Center for Autism and Brain Development. Her research has focused on autism early detection, treatment, brain function uh, throughout basically the course of her career. And she's the author of An Early Start for Your Child. Dr. Dawson, thank you so much for coming on and talking with me today. Oh, thanks so much for inviting me. And I'm so glad we can use this technology to reach so many people. That's wonderful. Yeah. So like kind of like what I had said before, I mean, we've been looking at early intervention for a while now. And can you tell me like over the last 20 to 30 years, because it seems like um, as a science, I think that the researchers kind of kind of have their hands around autism and being able to identify it earlier. So what are some of the things that we've learned over the last, like I said, two to three decades about that? Yeah, so let's start out by talking about early detection, which is what you mentioned in the introduction. And I really want to reinforce something that you said, which is that parents should trust their own instincts. And there's actually been published papers now that show that parent concern is a very reliable early indicator that something might not be going right. Now, it's not always the case. Sometimes, you know, we can be concerned and find out that actually, you know, nothing's going on. But in most cases, we find that parents are pretty good at detecting that something just doesn't seem to be developing in the normal way for their child. And it is true that often parents will bring these concerns to their pediatrician, and then the pediatrician will take a wait and see approach. And so we strongly encourage parents not to accept that. And there are some tools you can find on the internet. So if you Google uh, the modified checklist for autism and toddlers, or what we call the MCHAT, um, you'll find a screening tool, for example, on the Autism Speaks website that you can fill out and it will give you a risk score. And pediatricians are very familiar with that tool because it's actually recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And you can bring that in and sometimes that will help them listen. But, you know, regardless, you know, the, uh, the access to early intervention can make a big difference. And even if your child, as you say, ends up not having autism, um, these kinds of early interventions that you can do at home or sometimes you know, with a therapist or sometimes in a preschool um, can really make a difference in your child's ability to acquire language, develop social skills, um, and eventually you know, lead, lead a more independent life. So when it comes to those early, the early identification, are we finding that we're able to identify children younger or we're still about the same as we've been for about the last 20 years? No. Well, when I first started in my career, we thought that we couldn't diagnose autism until about three years of age because we were very focused on language as one of the early delays that we often see. 
Uh, but we've learned so much more now. And we know that for most kids, the symptoms begin to emerge between about six and 12 months. And so what we find is that the babies during this period are not engaging in sort of the normal types of social interactions that we'd expect a baby to be doing. So sometimes it's they're not paying or attention to people or having as much interest as that we would expect in looking at people. Sometimes it's not babbling back and forth. We start to see that mama and baba and that back and forth babbling during that period. And then towards the end of that period, we start to see babies developing gestures. So they start to wave bye-bye, they point at things. Um, and when kids are developing autism, they're usually not developing those gestures. Another early sign is not responding when your name is called. So if you call your child's name and they're not turning to look during the six to 12 month period, you know, that, that also can be a concern. Now it could be, you know, due to other reasons, but it's one of the early signs that we see. Now I should point out that about 25% of kids develop normally um, till about one to two years of age and then lose skills. So we do see variability in terms of how symptoms start to emerge. But for most kids, I think parents will start to get concerned um, usually between six to 12 and certainly by 12 to 18 months of age. And so those, that's the time where you just need to bring those concerns to your pediatrician and you know, make sure your voice is, is heard. Yeah, that was my son. He developed fairly normally the first year of life. He had about 10 to 12 words by the time he was like 13, 14 months. And then over the course of the next two to three months, one word at a time just like disappeared. And then he just like literally just kind of disconnected. And um, I encourage families to look at home videos um, because that when I looked back at home videos, I was like, oh my goodness, because sometimes you don't see it when you're in the moment. But when you look back and you're like, oh, look at how, you know, he or she changed during these six months or whatever it was. And now, you know, everybody's, everybody's taking video with this thing. <laughs> so right. nobody has an excuse for not having video. Um, yes. So when it comes to uh, the identification, is there, is there an age that's too early? Like, should, should somebody like, you know, where we, you know, you just kind of talked about, you know, if your doctor says, just wait, don't wait. But is there a point where you should go, okay, maybe I am being a little bit too, maybe it's too early. Should I give it more time? Or is it just go with your gut kind of thing? Well, there's not many centers that are um, able to really diagnose or even, you know, talk about being at risk for babies be in the six to 12 month period. So that there are some, so we have a baby clinic and we will see babies as early as six months. Uh, but most pediatricians will think that's too young because we know that during that period of six to up to around 18 to 24 months, that the diagnosis is not always reliable. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't start intervention. So one of the things that we know is that during that period, the baby's brain is developing, they're acquiring social skills. So there are strategies that you can use at home during that period where we can't make a reliable diagnosis, which is up to about 18 to 24 months, but you can still be doing things at home that could help your baby. And these things are strategies and, and we'll talk about how you can get access to learning about these strategies, but these are strategies that would help any child. So it, it, you don't have to have a diagnosis of autism for them to be helpful. If you're starting to see that your child just doesn't seem to be developing language or social skills in the way that you expect, there are some things you can do at home to help stimulate your baby's development. And so that's what we do when babies come into our baby clinic. We can't make a diagnosis before about 18 months, but we can tell parents, let's just start um, using these strategies at home because they can only be helpful. And then we monitor the child and by about 18 months, you can make a reliable diagnosis of autism. So can you talk about some of the things, and not necessarily at home, but sort of just in general, when we think about early intervention, what might that look like? Does it have a name? Should we gravitate towards things that say applied behavior analysis or verbal behavior? Or, or, or is it just looking at the child and moving forward based upon what you see? Right. 
Well, there's some really important principles in thinking about choosing an early intervention. There are, there's no studies that have been published that really take two interventions that are both have been empirically validated, meaning tested in clinical trials, and put them head to head. So we actually can't say, oh, traditional ABA or applied behavior analysis is, you know, better than say floor time or some other intervention. There, we just have not done those studies. The most important thing is to choose an intervention that has been scientifically validated, that there is some science behind it that has shown that this can be helpful for the child developing language, social skills, cognitive skills. And there's really several of them. All of them do have as a foundation applied behavior analysis. So even the um, more play-based interventions, such as say the Early Start Denver model, which is one that uh, Sally Rogers and I developed, even though it's much more play-based and relationship focused than a traditional ABA program that might be using things like discrete, discrete trials training, it still has as its foundation applied behavior analysis, which is the science of learning. It's, it's breaking down skills into small steps and then providing a context in which the child is encouraged to, to learn those skills and then rewarded for doing it. It's just there's many different ways of doing that from very structured um, sort of routine ways such as discrete trial training, which is a type of traditional ABA, all the way to much more play-based approaches such as the Early Start Denver model where the interactions are more naturalistic um, than what you would see in um, a traditional ABA program. If a parent lives in an area where either they don't have access to therapists because they live an hour by car from the nearest town where there might be a therapist or there might not be, um, what are some of the things that they can do like at home? What type of activities can they do with their child that would be considered early intervention, whether the child has been diagnosed or not, just a kid who you're noticing, there might be some developmental likings here. Okay, well, I'm gonna actually return to that question in just a second, because I wanna elaborate on choosing an early intervention, um, because there's a couple of other um, features that I think are really important for parents to be looking for, besides the fact that they're built on applied behavior analysis and that they have science behind them. And that is that they should be individualized. So we know that the, uh, every child is different and the therapist should be working to develop a very individualized pr a program that is tailored to the needs of your child. And then they also should be collecting data to see whether what they're doing is actually working and constantly making modifications if your child is not acquiring skills. So that sort of data-based and very individualized approach is really important. And if you don't see, if someone says, look, this is a treatment, it works for everyone and it's the same for everyone, that's already a red flag. But also there should be this openness to saying, you know, I tried the strategy, it doesn't seem to be working, let's now modify and try a different strategy. And I've been collecting data to make sure that I know that it's working. So those are some of the features that you look for in a therapist, whether it's in a preschool or an individual therapist that you have working in your home. But in terms of what parents can do at home, um, the really good news is that in the last, say, 10 years or so, we've been developing uh, parent-delivered interventions that parents can do at home and during, in the context of all their just regular activities. And if you think about it, the typical child is learning every moment. So yes, of course we do put kids in school where they're you know, having time, where they're you know, specifically working on something. But in fact, learning occurs in every interaction with the world and with other people. And so that's the context that we wanna create at home for the child that is developing autism, that we wanna use those everyday interactions so that they have many opportunities for learning, just like a typical child would. With a, with a typical child, they're very oriented to other people and interested in other people. So during their, that interaction, they're learning about other people. 
But if the child isn't interested in other people, they're, they're missing out on all of those opportunities for learning. So we have some really good strategies that parents can use at home during their everyday activities. So it could be mealtime or bath time or out at the park. And there are strategies to draw the child's attention to you as a, as a parent. And then once you have their attention to help them to learn to communicate and interact socially. And these are um, strategies that we've found in studies that, that parents can learn readily. So uh, there's really been multiple studies now that show that parents can learn to use these strategies quite well and, and do as well as a therapist actually in, in doing these types of strategies. So there's, there's many models. Um, there, it's been so effective that there are several models out there that, that people have developed. Um, we have developed one that's based on the Early Start Denver model. And we've uh, written a book that parents can get on Amazon. And I, I know you're going to provide the link to that. And it, it describes in language that parents can understand simple things that you can do at home with you know refrigerator lists that can remind you of some of the strategies that you're working on. And it goes through different domains of the child's development and gives you strategies for each of those. Um, more recently, we have um, developed a tool that is online that goes through these same strategies, but it teaches you uh, through an interactive tool that parents can access online. And it shows videotapes of parents actually using these strategies so you can see what they look like and um, really goes through all the same information that we have in that book. And that um, online tool is open to the public free. Um, and so we'll make sure to give you that link. And so the good news is that people that may be, you know, out in a, say, because of COVID or for other reasons, they're having trouble getting access to intervention. These are things that you can do at home that really make a difference. Is there a certain amount of hours per day uh, that a parent should look for to when they start thinking about truly early intervention? Is there a certain amount of hours that a parent should look to either to work with their child themselves or to have therapists at home, whether it's a home program where therapists are coming in or going out to a therapy center? Um, is there any sort of rule or guidance on how much time that would yeah, so I'm going to give you sort of two, two answers to that question. One is if you're um, thinking about putting your child in, say, a program or you're going to hire a therapist or in some way you're thinking, how much intervention does my child need? Um, well, the first thing is we don't know a, a scientific answer to that um, because there haven't been really good studies that have compared you know, what's the difference if you do 15 hours or 40 hours a week of intervention? So uh, a lot of uh, experts in the field who have done intervention work got together and said, let's at least make some recommendation. So the current recommendation based on just clinical consensus is that you would look for about 25 hours of intervention uh, for your child in, in any given week. And that could be, um, you know, occupational therapy, speech therapy. It could be, you know, a therapist-based intervention that's such as, you know, ABA, um, or anything where you're actively working with the child to help them learn. Um, we so 25 is fine. We do. We absolutely are not pushing for the 40 hours a week that you used to hear about in, in the old days, so to speak which kind of didn't account for the fact that kids need to take naps and parents need to eat and things like that. Um, but we also have some more recent evidence that 15 hours a week is probably adequate. So, you know, somewhere between 15 and 25, I think is what you're looking for. Now, when you think about at home, and rather than thinking about how many hours should I be using these strategies, I think it's better to think about how can I incorporate these strategies into whenever I interact with my child. And so I think that in some ways it takes a little bit of the pressure off. You're not thinking, oh my gosh, I didn't sit down for an hour. Now, certainly it's great if you can sit down and play and use these strategies in a very intentional way. But honestly, you know, whether you're at the grocery store or 
um, you know, putting your child in, in, into their car seat in the car. I mean, you can use these strategies um, in all of those contexts. So that's a way I would think about that. Yeah, when my son was little, we, it was prior to the technology era, of course, that we have today, but it was the TV set that was the big thing at the time. And once we had a diagnosis, the TV set went off, except for a very pocketed period of time at the end of the day. And uh, a lot of the intervention was just play. Yes. It was just, con it was constant and it was work for me because I had a toddler who, who couldn't amuse himself appropriately with toys. So it was teaching, but it was play. It was teaching him how to actually roll a car or a train rather than wanting to flip it and, and do this with the wheels. So it was teaching and it was work, but it was really just, it was play. And so yeah. it didn't feel like, you know, intensive intervention, but yet it very much was intensive. It was intensive on me <laughs> for sure, because it was dedicated time. But I mean, even going on, on the swing in the backyard, teaching him that when he wanted to get pushed, he had to at least make some type of eye gaze up at me or, you know, some type of social connection with me because he wasn't able to verbally communicate at the time, but to let me know that he wanted me to push him because uh, he was so used to getting things, which I think a lot of kids with autism, they get so used to getting what they want, either because you already know as a parent what they want, so you jump the gun and you, right. you give them that, or they have a behavior, so then you give them what they want because they had a behavior, and then later on, you're like, where did that behavior come from? Um, so we got to be really careful with that. Um, but for kids who maybe didn't, you know, they were two, three, four, maybe even five, and they, they just didn't get early intervention. And now kindergarten is here and they have a teacher who's saying, uh oh, something is up and we need to do an evaluation. Is it too late then for early intervention? How late is too late if there is a too late? Right. Well, there used to be an old view of how the brain developed, which in the old view was that you know, there's very rapid development of the brain from, you know, birth up through, you know, some people would say age three, others age five, and then it kind of plateaus and that everything has to happen during that period. Uh, but that old view now has been completely discarded. And we know that the brain develops actually throughout your whole life, even into adulthood, and that it remains plastic and able to learn. And so it's really never too late. Uh, not even in adulthood is it too late that we still can recruit and, and stimulate and engage the brain and it can develop new connections. So obviously we want to start as early as possible, um, but it's never too late. And we've had you know, many kids that don't get diagnosed until they get into school and then start to get intervention and do quite well. So, um, you know, I don't I never want parents to think that it's too late or that there's a window that they have, you know, they're, they're now have passed and that their child cannot benefit from early intervention. Yeah, I used to, my son's, most of his early intervention was me on a race because I heard age five, age yeah. five, that's it. They're going to cap you. at age five. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that everybody who, everybody who's watching this, um, we've all made a lot more progress from age five to where we are today than we did up to age five. I mean, not that we don't get some great stuff out of that birth to five, but yet, I don't know about you, but I learned something new every day. Yes, no, absolutely. And, you know, similarly, there was a, there was an old view. And in fact, as uh, clinicians, we would sometimes uh, say this, I didn't, but I would hear others say it, that if a child hasn't developed language by five, that they probably won't develop language. That also is not true. We have found that a lot of kids actually develop language during elementary school or even later. And so it is important to um, not think, oh, you know, this child will never develop language, but, but to keep using those strategies that will help promote spoken language. Now, that doesn't mean that you aren't at the same time using other uh, augmentative communication devices so just to help the child communicate if they're not using language, but you can still stimulate, stimulate language. And often we do see 
some of the first words up, you know, at eight, age 10, it can happen later. Um, for the parent who is looking to start something, some type of early intervention, is there any type of like kind of like a guidepost for a parent to try to decide what type of therapy or what type of approach it should be? Or is it just, well, we're going to kind of throw it at the wall and see if it sticks. I mean, is there, is there anything for them to help them to pick and choose what they should start with? Well, I do, th I do think there's um, choices that are somewhat based on just what do I have access to? Um, so I don't want to put pressure on parents to think, oh, I, I must get this kind of intervention and I'm going to do anything. I've seen parents move, for example, and sell their homes um, in order to get a specific kind of intervention. So what I would do is to survey the interventions that are available in your community and then use those guideposts that I gave earlier, which is, is this an intervention that has science behind it? Is this an intervention that is individualized to my child? And is the intervention one where the therapist or the teacher was willing to try different things if, if it is not working and they're collecting data. So they said that you need to hear from the school or the therapist that they have outlined specific goals for your child with an idea of when they think that that child could achieve that goal. And then they're monitoring whether they achieve that goal. And if they're not, they're changing their strategy. So I think if, if a, a program meets those qualifications, and if you happen to have more than one that have different flavors or style, one might be more structured, the other might be more play-based and relationship-focused, then I think it gets into just what matches with you. Uh, because when you think about when you choose a school for any child, you're often matching it to both the parent's style and also the child's style. So some children may thrive on a much more structured approach and really do well in that. And others may really thrive in a much more um, naturalistic uh, play-based approach. So we can also think about matches, uh, but truly I think if you meet those criteria that I outlined, then any of those are going to be good for your child. Yeah, we have um, a question. Let me just get to this. We have a question that says the public school system really helped. Um, he was in a preschool program for one and a half school years before starting kindergarten. Uh, what has been her, oh, she wants to know what your experience has been with public versus private in general. Has there been a difference? I wouldn't um, classify, you know, private versus public. And this kind of gets into that question of, you know, should it be a self-contained classroom? Should it be an inclusion-based classroom? There's so many different ways in which kids can receive their education. And rather than making a blanket statement, I really think about what is the best match for my child? And then also, what is the relationship between the, the people in the room, the adults? So it could be the teacher and the aide, the other therapist, and my child. So are they open and really interested and motivated to be working with my child? And I have really good communication with them. And then finally, you know, is my child making progress in this context? So if, you, if any of those things are missing, that you don't have a good relationship, that they're not really paying attention, um, or that the child isn't making progress into goals that you've set through your IEP and that are very explicit, then you can start to question, you know, either this isn't a good fit or maybe they need to be doing something different in the classroom. Yeah, I think um, what I definitely got most out of what you said today was on the, you know, is your child making progress? Mm -hmm. And I, I find that, you know, parents, especially when their kids are in school, parents go to these IEP meetings and sometimes they hear the same thing year after year, the IEP sounds the same. And I don't think a lot of parents, maybe they don't know that they have rights to question and say, how meaningful is the learning that's happening? Because wasn't that a goal from right. the, last, the last two years? So really being able to keep track of your kid and look to see is what you're doing actually moving them in the direction that you want them to move. 
Yeah, absolutely. I know that when, cause we, we developed, you know, our own home program cause I couldn't afford, I couldn't afford all the therapies. And that was because it was a while ago, uh, you know, insurance, but there was no, there was no such thing as insurance for any, any of the interventions that we were uh, integrating, especially like use of the ABA um, methodology. So we created our own home program. And I mean, I lived by my data sheet. Yes. I made sure that I was tracking it so that even for me, I could look back and see, wow, okay, so he was doing really good two weeks ago. And what happened today? To be able to look to see what are the things that kind of came up. So I think that's really important. Um, I want to thank you so much for coming on and talking to me. We really appreciate your time. We know you're an extremely busy woman. Um, so thank you for giving us all that information, um, for just taking the time to talk to us today. Well, it was, it was very much my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And everybody else, we are going to put the link here. So right here where my finger is, you'll see it in just a bit. I'm going to put the link here for the book so that you can um, get that book. I mean, I, I, you know, if it was around back when my son was little, I definitely would have had it just so that I can use it as a guide and help me move forward in helping my kid get the early intervention that he needed. And, and then I'm also going to share the link that Dr. Dawson referred to, and we will put that in the comments below. Uh, so whether you're watching this on Facebook or whether you're watching it on YouTube, if you just look at the comments below, we'll put the link there. Thank you guys for joining us. Have a beautiful day. Dr. Dawson, thank you for your great wisdom and all that you do for the autism community as a whole. We really appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. Take care, everyone.